So one of the things you're going to have to tell me, Ming, is how good my Chinese is, because I'm going to refer to a variety of words in Chinese as we go through this uh, podcast, vlog. Um, and you might tell me that I need to study harder, just like people used to say to me when I was at school. <laughs> but welcome, Ming Zhao. Really nice to see you, sir. Thank you. My pleasure to be here. <laughs> Well, not only uh, are we in the same space because we both work in sport, but now you've just told me as we, uh, we welcomed each other, and it genuinely is really fantastic to see you again. You're in a really keen part of Manchester in terms of the, the heritage of football in Manchester. Close to Main Road, close to Platte Lane, the former home before the Etihad. But I think you're are you an, an honorary Mancunian now. Are you a proper Manchester lad? Uh, it depends how you define it, but I, I, I will consider myself, yeah. I think so. Mancunian, yeah, yeah. yeah. If, if I had the ability to give out the awards, I would officially make you uh, a Manchester person. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> well, just a little bit about my, 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 my background. I grew up in Beijing, the capital of uh, the most populous country in the world. And I moved to uh, England about 15 years ago. I've uh, been always living in this part of the country, Northwest. Um, originally in Preston and then moved to uh, Manchester. So I would consider myself local, being local. <laughs> and when you first came to Manchester, Ming, did you come here, was it, was it to do a university or...? Um... Um, I studied in Preston, which oh, is right. um, yeah, only 30 miles away from Manchester. Uh, just in case some some audience not familiar with the local <laughs> geography, yeah. And I moved to Manchester for work, basically, yeah. Yeah, after I finished university, I moved to Manchester. Uh, and what what was, your, was your original studies, Ming? Were they all sports related? Uh, not really. I studied in uh, Lancashire Business School. It's business related. Oh, right. And uh, I still consider sports, especially football industry, is um, it's relatively new, I think, from uh, um academic perspective, I think. But there are loads of uh, transferable skills you can use from other disciplines. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, I didn't, I didn't um, study sports or sports management or media, that sort of uh, um, subjects, but I just used my skills, um, learn from those, uh, those subjects to uh, apply, apply them in, in the sports industry. <laughs> well, I think like you say, Ming, I think it's a, a business is always a good grounding. And uh, what, why I'm also especially pleased to see you on here today is because uh, like I said to you off air, um, you're very much what I perceive as the, the next generation of uh, sporting <laughs> professional and um, you, you already achieved some phenomenal successes in your short career, but I'm absolutely convinced you're going to go on to bigger and better things. So I'm grateful to you giving the time to, to talk to me today. Thank you. <laughs> now, what I have to do straight away is it's like um, it's a bit like a quiz, this interview, because I'm going to ask you lots of questions. and. Mm. Sometimes okay. you might you might look at me and you might say to me, "What is he talking about?" <laughs> Other times you'll know straight away. But um, you'll you, I've called it I've called this vlog and this podcast sports, and there's obviously a double entendre. There's there's two meanings to this. One is because you and I are heavily involved in the in the field of sports. Mm -hmm. But two, I'm based in Stockport, so it's a play on S hyphen Port Stockport. So. On these uh, right, blogs, okay. we, we tend to have more than <clears throat> our fair share of uh, uh, brief discussions about Stockport. Um, and one of the things I was going to ask you is, okay. there's no reason why you do need to know this or not, because you're, 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 you're young. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. W were you aware of the connection between my hometown club, Stockport County Football Club, and the country of China? Um, I don't know. I'm not sure if we share the same knowledge, but... Personally, I've been to Stockport County twice or three times um, when the club played in um, Conference North or something, or Conference National Division a few years ago, uh, watching the first team playing. And uh, also, because I grew up in Beijing, and uh, my hometown club, um, they had a player, they used to have a player who uh, spent his youth career as at Stockport County. Oh, really? From yeah, in early two thousand. Yeah, but unfortunately, he never he never made it to the to the first team. He just um, um, he was sold to um, other countries to Australia. I think after Stockport years, um, that's the connection I know I know about um, between China and Stockport County. <laughs> well, Stockport County, as you know, it happens to be my club because it's my hometown. Um, 
but what I was proud about what they did is they, um, unlike some bigger clubs who, who, who looked at China and they thought, ah, oh, mm. this, this is a money-making machine. We need to get out there. Yeah, I believe Stockport. Uh, unless somebody tells me otherwise, otherwise, um, they always tried to do things the right way, and they had many journeys backwards and forwards from the United Kingdom to China, uh, mm. not talking business at all, but doing things like you quite often do this. It's the same in in the country of Turkey. It's all about building relationships, building trust, all that sort of thing before you even get into discussing any business and partnerships, but. Um, after a period of time, the, the, the current president of Stockport County, who initiated this, a guy called Steve Bellis, mm -hmm. um, Stockport County, when they were in Division 2, so it would have been the year 2000, year 2001, they became a 50% shareholder in a Chinese club. Oh, right. Okay, didn't know that. And this is the first time I practiced my Chinese, and, and Ming, please don't fall off your chair with laughter. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. But I think it, it's spelt, or I would pronounce it, uh, Liaoning. But it's L I A N, L I A O N I N G. Yes, it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, it's a place in China. It's, uh, yeah. It used to be a big club in China, yeah. So it used to be, apparently, Stockport were uh, obviously big clubs from the, our region, like Manchester United, had been going to China for a while. But mm -hmm. apparently, when Stockport County went there, and as I say, at the time they were in Division Two, they were one of the first English clubs to go to the west of China. Um, right. And the club that they became a fifty percent shareholding in was called, uh, ultimately, became called Stockport Tiger Star. Okay. Um, I can tell by by looking at you and listening to well, you, it, you're thinking it's I'm a name I never never came across. <laughs> unfortunately, no. So in that case, I'm, I am wondering whether or not they're still going because apparently, um, I know we did send managers out there, we did send players out there, we did all sorts of collaborative marketing, and for Stockport County, it was amazing because when they played in stadiums or when they arrived at airports, there was far more fans out there that came to watch than we'd ever find at home in Stockport. <laughs> <laughs> That, that that's life <laughs> right interesting to hear that yeah okay. yeah it was it was uh, it was interesting to say the least but uh, the relationship's still going uh, they used to have um uh, real sort of special meals put on vip meals they met all the dignitaries uh, and only last year there was there was a consortium from china that came back over to stockport to see the games oh wow yeah. okay the, the other thing and uh, please be aware it's not going to be just me talking ming <laughs> is uh, <laughs> I believe, uh, again, the same originator, Steve Bellis, um, I believe they did the first edition of, of a virtual TV show in China because he, along with a company called Fremantle Media, launched something called Soccer Prince. Did you ever see that on television? Uh, unfortunately not, no. Oh, don't worry, I'm, I'm doing well when, here. When was it on? Um... Well, I don't know. It must have been going back, a, I'm, I'm guessing, probably 10 years. But it was a reality right, TV okay. show with lots of, um, uh, not just soccer skills, but all sorts of uh, obstacles, competitions, and everything like that. But the winner of the show was guaranteed to uh, get a contract with an English Premier League club. And I believe the okay. uh, young Chinese boy that, that won it um, ended up, um, training and signing on with the academy at Everton Football Club. I think I probably yeah heard of the story in, in the press. Yeah, yeah well, if the, if the TV was on um, after two thousand five, that, that's after I moved to this country. That's yeah, maybe, maybe. I, I think they went it, on yeah. to uh, last time I heard. I think they were, they had the contracts to work in twenty countries with this virtual TV. So uh, mm. there you have it. So we're going to talk a lot about football. Obviously, just like many other places in the world, China is fabulous and fantastic in terms of its heritage and a whole host of different sports. But let's talk football. Um, yes. One thing that intrigued me and I didn't know um, was there is uh, more than I was first aware, Chinese ownership in terms of majority shareholding of uh, Premier League clubs and championship clubs in the UK. Were you, you aware of that, presumably? Yes, I... I believe there were even more a few years back. And uh, I believe it's all related to the new presidency um, after 2012, because President Xi um, is a big football fan. 
and uh, apparently you know how the system works in China if uh, you've got the you know political influence from from the top of the country and um, all of the businessmen want to get involved of the all, all sorts of projects and from 2012 um there were many uh, there were many um, news reports uh, about uh, chinese business Man, um, buying shares of uh, elite European football clubs. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask Premier League. Yeah. yeah, because I think in the Premier League, and you might correct me, Ming, because you're probably more up to date than me, but in the Premier League, certainly uh, there was the likes of uh, Southampton, uh, Wolverhampton Wanderers. When you go to. I know, yes, they are the major shareholders, yeah, Wolver Wolves and Southampton, but also Man City. Um, to my knowledge, Chinese business or thirty percent of City Group. Yes. All oh, right. Okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And then certainly, as you drop down into the the Championship, the, there's been the likes of uh, Reading, Barnsley, Birmingham City. Um, so uh, it, it's, yes. it's still prevalent. But you say you think there used to be more, did you? It used to be more. Um, Aston Villa used to be owned by Chinese, but they um, sold it to American businessmen. Businessman, I think just before they got promoted to the Premier League. Um, obviously, in, in other Euro big European countries like Spain or, or Italy, uh, the most prominent one is uh, Inter Milan. Um, their chairman is a young Chinese, uh, young Chinese man who was born after 1990. Right. <laughs> and uh, interesting, what's interesting is. Uh, the owner, the parent company of Inter Milan, um, owns um, the biggest sports um, broadcaster in China as well, which is called PPTV. Right. <laughs> and uh, since last season, I've been their football reporter, uh, European football reporter. <laughs> very interesting, very interesting. And then there was a there was obviously a, a big launch and lots of media coverage. Um, and I can't remember when it was. It, it feels like it was... Uh, a long, long time ago, but um, I'm, at least six years ago, I would imagine there was a lot of media coverage about Project Football, if you like, uh, in China, and China was going to invest a lot more into its league, into its football structure, and everything like that. Mm -hmm. I'm calling it Project Football. I don't think they actually said that in any magazine. But, <laughs> but, but, but how's it how's it going? What's your perception? Because you're at the sharp end of this. How is the the, the Chinese football model going in the country of China? Well, apparently the president really um, wants to see China play in the World Cup finals. <laughs> and unfortunately, China has only appeared once um, in the whole World Cup history. Uh, that was back in 2002 in South Korea and Japan. And many people believe it was um, because of uh, the economic benefit rather than just uh, just come, you know, uh, unfilled performance. That's why um, China um, got a chance to play in the finals. And apparently, um, not just the government officials, the football fans, the, the, the general people there want to see China play again in the, in the World Cup finals. So um, they've launched loads of uh, football-related projects, including, develop, uh, including de developing um, local youth talents and cooperating, uh, partnering with European uh, football clubs. And uh, also including those uh, big investment, you know, into uh, the Premier League clubs or, or other European league clubs. Yes, uh, it's, it's it's still going, and uh, there have been lots of uh, you know new stories about uh, what sort all sorts of football related uh, things in China, um, covering both European football or world football, Chinese football league. And also over the last decade, we've heard loads of uh, uh, news report um, about Chinese league uh, simply because there are loads of big transfers here, you know, here the headlines. <laughs> and uh, lots of hot money there, which is good for the, for the sport here. So leave me on because uh, I respect you as a friend, <laughs> as friend Ming. Um, let's put you on the spot, putting you on the spot in a nice way. Um, of all of these expensive international footballers that have been transferred into China, who mm -hmm. do you think has been the big, biggest success? Um, I will say a Brazil international, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> I will say the Brazil international, um, Renato um, Augusto. Uh, maybe English fans not that familiar with him. He used to play in bon German's Bundesliga for Bayer Leverkusen. Um, the reason I pick him is 
not just because he played for my hometown team, it's because he um, apparently he showed um, big dedication, a uh, long commitment to, to Chinese league, not like many other players, just uh, spending one or two years in China, uh, making enough money and then transfer back to Europe. And he joined the Chinese league about five years ago, and uh, he really has shown his, his commitment there. And he has maintained really um, high quality, high standard, and he represented Brazil in the World Cup, in the Russian World Cup, and also scored goals for them. And uh, and also, well, you 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 can argue uh, many many big names play in China for money. Uh, can't deny that. But um, when you are making big money from what you do, and also um, you show you um, professionalism and your commitment to the country to the to the job, I think that's that really makes you um, different from from the I don't know makes you stand out from the rest of uh, of the you know foreign players in China. Um, I don't think, um, but not, I, I would say not everyone is, uh, is like him <laughs> in China. Well, I, I in, think- In Chinese uh, history, yeah. Yeah, I think you and I are the same. We, we've got similar standards, similar ethics. And I think what you're saying is, is something that would be my stance, yeah. certainly your stance, but it's not shown by everybody. I, I, exactly, I believe there's nothing wrong to make money because it's a profession. You still need to, um, yeah, when when you're at the prime of your career, you need to make good money from from what you do. But it's also about yeah, professionalism, and uh, also we've seen uh, lots of uh, failed examples in the Premier League as well, like uh, uh, United signing of uh, Alex Sanchez. Apparently, he's a uh, big signing. Um, the, his his salary salary bill is probably the highest um, at United, but but we all see his contribution is very little. <laughs> He's, he's yeah. just been just been removed off the wage bill as of yesterday because uh, he's been yeah. permanently transferred to Milan now. <laughs> yeah, but I uh, and again you're in the broad broadcast industry, so I wouldn't undermine you by asking you too many difficult questions. But um, I will I, I will put forward one example of possibly uh, one of the the less successful, um, and arguably it could be said um, didn't really buy into the ethics that you and I have just described. I think when interviewed, to, to my knowledge, the last thing he said was that his year in China, he perceived it to be his vacation, which was hardly a sign of commitment. This was an ex-Manchester United, ex-Manchester City player, uh, Tevez. Uh, $40 million, four goals, 12 months, and then sold, arguably as a failure, back to Boca in his own home country of Argentina. Unfortunately, yes, he's uh, apparently he's not very popular in China. <laughs> uh, after his, you know, poor stats you just mentioned, um, as um, as uh, one, well, as uh, probably reportedly the, the the top earner um, in world football, uh, probably he earned even more money than Lionel Messi or his or Cristiano Cristiano Ronaldo uh, when he was in China, but he only scored four goals for. His club Shanghai Shenhua, and uh, according to um, Chinese media, he brought his family members and extended family all along with him to China. It's like he's uh, he brought a big business or something with him, and he paid his family and friends to accompany him in China, and he's more seen. <laughs> In Disneyland, Shanghai, in Disneyland Shanghai rather than in the training page or, or other football related things. <laughs> yeah, so it's very, very wrong uh, mentality. It's very unprofessional under any standard. Um, it doesn't matter how much money you make. Even if you, uh, you play for, for a lower league team, you still need to show you 100% um, commitment to professionalism, you know, um, contribute to your contribution. Well, I think when, when, we, yeah. uh, when we get out of this pandemic, what we need to do is uh, I will take you as my guest for a bite to eat at Stockport County again uh, okay. for no other reason than I'll introduce you to the president and you'll see what a warm welcome you get because uh, as a club, they absolutely love Chinese people. So uh, that's the way that it should be done, friendship. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah, that'd be my pleasure. Thank you. So, like I say, uh, I look at you with pride. I've even put my own social media out when I see you on television and think, ah, I know Ming. 
Um, <laughs> so you're doing really well in terms of the the, the broadcast world at the moment. Um, tell us tell us tell us about a bit more about that channel and what your role is there. Well, basically, I've been involved in uh, football media in China for five seasons uh, since 2015, and uh, I. Just, as I just mentioned a bit earlier, the, the channel I work with is called PP Sport and its parent company also owns um, Italian City Art Clubs in Milan and uh, it's the, I can say it's the biggest sports uh, football broadcaster in China at the moment and uh, the, the channel um, has the broadcasting rights of uh, English Premier League, UEFA Champions League and uh, like Bundesliga, uh, Celia, other Euro big European leagues broadcasting rights in China. And uh, since last season, a year ago, um, PP Sport has acquired the uh, broadcasting rights of the Premier League uh, for this uh, three year cycle. So I've been their um, chief reporter um, based in England, um, reporting the Premier League, mainly on field reports and conducting. Uh, post-match interviews with players, managers, and uh, sometimes mid-week um, interviews with players um, at their training grounds, those kind of things, yeah. Excellent. And also been lovely to travel um, around Europe, uh, recording European uh, Champions League or, or Europe, Europa League. Uh, just stopped uh, when the pand pandemic happened, <laughs> so yeah. So before, basically so before... Before the lockdown, I hardly uh, spent a whole week at home, and after the lockdown, I haven't been anywhere <laughs> that much just, uh, for almost half a year. <laughs> so for the last year, it's like two extremes of my life. <laughs> well, hopefully we'll be uh, seeing some light at the end of the tunnel and things can change and you can get back to normality. <laughs> Finger crossed. <laughs> so again, in, in the current um, uh, political uh, issues, if you like, that are in the media between China and the UK, there's been a slight suggestion that there might be a cutback on the exposure given to the English Premier League in terms of China. Is that, is that, is that what you've heard? Um, what's been rumoured um, since, uh, I think, just before the last match day of, or last two match days of the Premier League of the, of the last season, um, been rumoured that the state TV in China would... Um, some sort of boycott the, the, the showing of uh, Premier League matches. Um, but I don't think it will materialize because first it's, uh, it's more like a political gesture or some sort of thing. Because uh, mm -hmm. in terms of market share, um, the European football um, media, the broadcasting market is mainly is dominated by um, private, private channels like PP Sports or Super Sports. And the state TV has only, I would say, probably less than five percent of the market share. So even if they uh, stop showing the the state TV stop <coughs> stop showing Premier League in China, it won't affect the market significantly. It's more like a political um, a gesture or threatening, if you'll say, um, a major political role, constant political role between China and the West. Um, unless there's uh, a revelation or some sort of thing from the from the authorities saying, okay, we will stop um, showing um, English football or European football completely in the, in the Chinese market, that that will be completely a different story. But I doubt that will happen given the the amount of money the broadcasters have paid to the Premier League, and for this current broadcasting cycle, the uh, PP Sport has paid about over $700 million to the Premier League. It's one of the highest payers um, uh, compared to, to, to other international broadcasters. Probably it's compar comparable with uh, US, NBC, and uh, Middle Eastern being sports. So given the economic scale, um, the amount of money um, have been paid to um, to the Premier League, so I really doubt um, that the authorities mm -hmm. would, you know, ban the Premier League straight away. Yeah, I presume that would that would incur lots of uh, legal um, contractual um, disputes. Because yeah, if uh, if that happened. The other thing is that um, what what I admire about you, uh, Ming, is that. Um, 
not only are you, are you becoming an extremely talented person in the broadcast industry, but you also understand marketing and some of the things I've noticed you've been putting out on social media. I think one of the things I, uh, I noticed recently was about the uh, the KPMG benchmarking report. Um, mm. I, I looked into <clears throat> that as I have to do for my job and um, I remember there was a statement in there which struck a chord with me and I, and I guess it still applies equally to China. And that is that <laughs> in terms of big brand uh, EPL, English Premier League clubs, arguably in this day and age, but actually not just EPL, also going into uh, other giants within Europe, arguably within what could be perceived as fans, i.e. people that can contribute towards the income of clubs, maybe through buying merchandise rather than actually going to the stadium or pay-per-view or whatever, uh, it said 80 to 90% of those people who are perceived to be fans um, are outside the country, so not even in the same country as the club itself. And I think with the, with the, with the likes of China, because of the, such a the large population and such an affinity with sports, um, I think that's a trend that's just going to continue. Am I right? Um, definitely, especially the trend will be accelerated, I, I believe, um, as a result of the pandemic, because um, um, because the fans won't be allowed um, back into the stadium for the at least for the uh, a few more months. So um, all of the uh, marketing efforts or campaigns will be done online and digitally. So that would so it doesn't matter where you live on the planet as long as you have access to the internet. Um, well, the, the, you will be part of the, the whole um, global strategy of especially the elite, elite clubs of the Premier League or, or big European um lakes yes um definitely and also i don't know if you've heard of uh, my united opening a um experience experience center that's how it's called in beijing oh, really? um in the first half of this year yeah it's more like amusement park thing <laughs> but it's a manchester united uh, theme amusement park it's manchester yeah or theme park yeah in beijing it's a physical store it's not like the the digital um, online campaign marketing campaign or something and it's permanent as far as i know That's in in beijing yeah so the fans um probably can buy merchandise and or or probably i presume it's a mini museum there as well and lots of uh, my united related activities or campaigns um will take place there and uh, you can see how um, ambitious um, some big clubs <laughs> in terms of you know, global market. Yeah. yeah. Interesting, interesting. And, <laughs> and because it's topical at the moment, and because it relates to digital marketing, mm -hmm. um, what, what, what perceptions have you got on the current discussions about TikTok? Um, TikTok in its own right, but also TikTok in terms of its use as a uh, digital marketing platform in football, in sports as a whole. Yeah, unfortunately, it's uh, TikTok is in the middle of the um, ongoing political role between the US and China. And uh, I believe uh, the digital assets of many big European clubs are at stake um, at the moment because I just did a quick um, quick um, in-house research the other day, earlier this week. Um, typically, the big late clubs have uh, like two or three million uh, followers on TikTok. It's not that big um, comparing to um, the, the big four uh, digital platforms, social platforms like Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter, but still it's the one of the uh, fastest growing um, social platforms in the world. And it's especially popular um, among the young generation, teenagers, Gen Z. Uh, Absolutely. Probably and uh, it, it represents the future and uh, they might not have that much buying power at the moment but, uh, you know in five ten years time you know it's, uh, it's going to be the the future it's a trend um but unfortunately yes um the tiktok is only mainstream i would say mainstream and social platforms um from china and uh, all the others are owned by american companies and uh, I think I think it's a very sad story. And uh, this morning I just uh, read some news. Uh, I think the President Trump is trying to give the forty-five day um, time limit to TikTok and WeChat. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's uh, I don't I, I I don't think 
I think the, probably the, the, the best solution is uh, to transfer the, the, the company or TikTok's overseas operation to, um, to maybe European or American based, uh, I don't know, uh, sorry, transfer the ownership of the company to, to, to a European or American company, yeah. That's in the latest the best was they might even come to London as a as a head office for that European. So uh, we'll see. Well, let's see if that can uh, make America happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the the obviously uh, as the, another impressive thing on your CV yeah. is you, you spent a, a chunk of time at uh, uh, Burnley Football Club, uh, yeah. which was, was uh, interesting to hear. Uh, and I'm moving into the realms now in the discussion talking about sponsorship. Uh, I watch very closely with my Turkish links that you know that uh, mm. uh, certainly uh, we had Huawei, which who is a, a main sponsor at Galatasaray, which happens to be the uh, my family's team over in Turkey. Not my team. Okay. I, I, I have to support small clubs, but my family support Galatasaray, and okay. we've got many a shirt in our house with Huawei on it. Um, there was something which uh, made you and I smile, uh, and that was. Um, but the last time we met was in Bucharest, and you were very nicely branded up with the sponsor's name of Laba, the gambling company, which I won't go into now in too much detail, but it was interesting <laughs> that apparently in Romania it translated into something else. Um, I, did, I did notice when I was looking this uh, up before I saw you today that um, uh, that story was covered somewhere in an English newspaper. Does that mean that we've got a, a, a mole in the camp? Did somebody... After Bucharest, go and whisper that we'd, we'd uh, discovered this thing out there in Romania. <laughs> I think I heard about it um, just before we traveled to uh, Romania. Yeah, I think I read it somewhere, maybe from the Sun or, or some tab tabloid, um, a UK tabloid here yeah, about the the name, the meaning of the name in Romanian language. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's not long after the deal was signed between the club and the, and the sponsor. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. something somebody suggested is uh, is not very. Or strange in the foreign language, in the European language, yes. Um, yeah, just like you said, I spent a uh, season last year um, at, a, at a club and mainly my job was mainly about um, marketing. It's a marketing related role. It's about to uh, promote the brand of the club and, and its, principal, its principal partner mainly in, 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 in the Asian market. And uh, it's it's very 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 good experience, yeah. It brought me very close to a Premier League club and to see how it's run and how the business deal, I don't know how how, how a partnership is run and uh, in terms of brand activation, um, marketing campaigns, lead generation, those kind of things, and also it involved a lot of media work. And uh, I think nowadays media and marketing, it, what media marketing used to be. Um, separate uh, disciplines but nowadays it's more and more interchangeable in the digital era i think yes i think i noticed recently that they've been uh, uh, putting out a job advert for a global partnership manager and i noticed when as soon as i saw that it, it, that's quite a, a new position for burnley football club but i did think ah i bet that's some of ming's former work because uh, you were so proactive in terms of your partnership <laughs> work overseas yeah, yeah, I believe, yeah. I believe that's uh, probably because of the new CEO of the club, yes. and uh, cause, yeah, and uh, I remember he's very uh, open-minded person, very nice person, a new heart, and he's uh, he always wanted to you know expand the 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 the, the appeal, appeal of the club, you know, at a, at a international stage rather than just locally, and. Uh, I believe that's uh, yeah, it's uh, it's part of the club's overall strategy, just to um, because Burnley is uh, is very very. Uh, we have to admit it's uh, it's a market in domestic market is very um, it's very hard to ex to explore more the domestic market. So it's probably its future um, is uh, international is an international state. But how to do it? It's very challenging. It's not an easy job. It's not one of the big six. It's not the. It's usually um, on the wrong side of the, of the <laughs> international, international um, or the backdrop of uh, international sports news report uh, when they report the the, the the stories of the big six, <laughs> like the um, remember the the um, the Premier League goal of last season scored by Spurs, um, Korean international. 
yeah. from homing. Uh, that goal was scored against Burnley. So. <laughs> oh, that goal was it? Yeah, yeah, what a phenomenal <laughs> goal it was. Uh, Ronaldo style goal, yes. Absolutely. <laughs> that goal was, uh, yeah, that goal has been played again and over and over again um, on UK TV and international TV. But unfortunately, Burnley was the backstroke of, the, of that goal. <laughs> <laughs> But and still, it's, uh, it's a big opportunity for the for the club or any club, small medium sized club in, in this country to explore the, the international market. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because um, uh, uh, listening to what you're saying in terms of where are you, what's your heritage, are you a, a more domestic based firm, uh, sorry, domestic based club? Do you have mm -hmm. outreach into global marketplaces? Certainly, the wonderful world of broadcast, the wonderful world of marketing does require constantly being on the ball, excuse the pun, and looking at the next opportunity. Mm. My, the closest I came to it was, um, I don't know whether you know or not, but I think you know my role in life. I tend to be parachuted into different sports clubs, work for them a year or two uh, as a uh, quasi-commercial director and then move on to the next contract. And mm. last year I was uh, commercial director at Manchester Giants, who's the, um, the British Basketball League pro club mm -hmm. in, in the city of Manchester. And I invited along uh, on a couple of occasions uh, as my guest, um, uh, a young lady from the China Basketball Association, who obviously had the buzz about basketball and she, she loved the fact that she could come in whenever she wanted and I'd give her access to any, anybody she wanted to have access to. Mm. Um, but again, if you look at that, at the time, it was before uh, this new home has been announced. So, so I don't know how much you know about Manchester Giants, but when they started as a basketball club, you were getting in excess of 15,000 people in the arena in Manchester, whereas in last year they played at a venue which couldn't really take more than about 1,000. And so that in its own right means you're not sustainable as a sports club. However, the one ticket that you could use that would attract more sponsors, attract more revenue, get more appeal, was the size of the digital footprint and the broadcast rights. So when you were looking at 20-odd live streaming channels and also the British Basketball League were talking about trying to do a, de a deal with China, which would mm. then give exposure to the Chinese marketplace. Mm -hmm. That's when you start to have a more commercially viable product going forward. So I'm not surprised Burnley are doing that. Definitely, yeah, yeah, I agree with you, yeah. Okay, so the last part of this interview, and uh, you've been exactly as I thought you'd be, uh, Ming. You've been uh, super articulate, uh, entertaining, uh, but also very uh, informative with your knowledge. But the last question is really, um, what is the future for, for Ming Zhao? Uh, you're in broad, you've, you've got background in marketing, you've got background in broadcast. Broadcast is dominating your time now, dominating it even more when you get out of lockdown. Um, <laughs> but if you look at um, where you are now, I, I described you as the next generation of sports professional. On this show, you get called a, a sporting genie. So you'll want to watch for the future. So where is the future <laughs> for Ming Zhao? Well, I like to obviously to um, stay in the stay in the football industry, and uh, I would like to use my uh, knowledge and skills gained from my, um, especially the media and the marketing knowledge from the last few years, and um, and I believe the two things, the, the two used to be um, separate areas, are emerging emerging now, and uh, they are very interchangeable, and uh, especially. Um, in, in the international business context and uh, also um, in terms of digital marketing, digital things and uh, I believe it's mainly, it's, it's heavily data driven and uh, I believe, yeah, um, I've got a background of uh, quantitative data research so I think that skill will be very uh, important, it's vital um, in terms of digital I would say digital business or digital marketing. So I would like to combine my skills as media marketing and the business analytics um, into my future career um, in the context of football industry, ideally in uh, international business context, I think, yeah. <laughs> well, you can be absolutely assured that I will keep my ears to the ground and if something uh ever gets uh, risen as a prospective opportunity, I'll be uh, straight on the phone to you. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> so Ming, that concludes your interview. Thank you very much for your time today. Uh, I will turn off the camera, but um, I'm sure everybody will find you as interesting as, as I've done. And uh, I hope our friendship certainly lasts uh, a lot longer into the future. It's only just started. 
hopefully yeah hopefully to to join you for 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 a live game at Stockport County um, thank you